I'm Michael Raper, I'm Director of Services at International Operations, and um, this is uh, a session on social inclusion, or overcoming social exclusion, and it's room three. So you're all in the right place? This is where you're meant to be? Good, 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 good. In that case, we can begin. Um, we have such a rich menu for you this afternoon. It's a, a chocolate box of samples, really and we'll be presenting to you such a rich variety, dipping into this chocolate box of overcoming social exclusion. Um, you know, Red Cross, like you, and like uh, everybody who works in Red Cross, and everybody who works in the sector, we're basically all after the same thing, pretty much. We want healthy uh, people, people who are healthy, people who feel valued, people who are able to participate, be participating members of our community. That's what we all want for people, healthy, happy, participating. And you know, the, the good news, there is good news, so let's focus on that for a minute. Take the 80-20 rule, about 80% of people figure that's where they're at. They're healthy, they're happy, they're able to participate. Just a little short of 80% of our population, which is good news, and it's helpful to focus on the fact there are a lot of good people with a lot of goodwill able to play a, a role in this. But the bad news, obviously, is on that 80-20 rule that 20% of our population feel and generally are excluded. And that's about five, four million people. They're not able to participate. They're not feeling healthy at times, not always necessarily. It, in times, they are vulnerable, not always. Um, but they're socially excluded. And there's a pocket within that deep pocket of people who are severely excluded, multiple suffering or, or experiencing um, multiple needs on many, many fronts. We heard um, our Secretary General, as Sai, talk about this. We talk, heard Eve Dakor, we heard Auntie talk about it at the opening, about, uh, and we heard Dawn O'Neill talk all about the fundamental thing that we need is respect and human dignity. And if people are excluded for whatever reason, for whatever period of time, that's being denied. So we all can play a role, and Red Cross tries to play a role, along with many, many other organisations, and some of them here today. Might be a small role, it might be just that one intervention, that one phone call, that one thing, at that point in time that helps bring somebody back in. Or it might be that these uh, protracted and wicked problems, these multiple um, d exclusions that people are experiencing need a longer set of supports and interventions. Um, that, so that's what we're here to address today, to, to, to explore, explore this um, with you, this whole area with you. As Red Cross tries to put together programs all over the country, um, depending on local circumstances, depending on funding, depending on need, to try and do work in this area to overcome social exclusion, to bring, build bridges for people back into community. And so what we have, as I said, is this chocolate box of um, samplers for you, this smorgasbord, this um, uh, buffet, really, of, of social inclusion delights for you to sample and see. Um, speakers are going to be pretty tight, but we have to move through four lots. I presume that's what attracted you, so we'll try to give each of them equal time, uh, except James only gets 15 minutes. Um, and uh, there probably won't be time for questions, but if we do get through early, we will. But the idea is to give you this taste of what can be done, how various people and various groups are seeking to address this issue in a whole range of different ways. And it could be, you know, as simple as a phone call. And that's not a bad place to start. Um, I'm not going to spend or waste any of your time going through the bios or the CVs of our fantastic bunch panel of speakers um, and participants here today. Um, they are all in the book. They are set out on, and they're in alphabetical order, as you probably discovered by now, because we're right near the end of the conference. And they're from page 32, 33, 36, 39, and 40. You will find the bios for these fantastic people. So let's not waste time on that. Let's get into the buffet. Um, the first person, as you can see, as you know from the program, uh, is Deb. Um, Deb Hansel. She um, can be credited in large measure uh, with developing this Tele Yarn program. And she has got with her one of our volunteers and one of the people on the other end of the phone 
And so we're going to bring them up, if you wouldn't mind, Deb, uh, and um, Amy, and uh, Elvis, if you could join us up here. And De Deb, I'm going to hand over to you at this stage, okay? All righty. and thank you for coming. I'll just give us a bit of a background on um, Teleyarn and how it started. I began work with the Red Cross in 2010 with a program called um, Tenant Connect which was funded by New South Wales Housing for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who could be soci socially isolated. While doing the, assessment, the assessments with um, Tenant Connect, I'd be always talking to our people and I'd find out like they, they wanted a longer talk and they wanted to find out more about us and um, we, we would start talking with the assessments and they wanted to find out like who's your family, where you're from and talk about like things like um, the knockout and uh, just have a good yarn and what bloody Captain Cook did to us in New South Wales. Um, a lot of the clients are part of the stolen generation and they like to talk about things like, like that and how it affects them and it impacts their lives and their family. A lot of the clients would also ask for um, if you could come out and do a face-to-face -face and sit with them and talk to them. At this stage, that's not possible because the manpower that we've got in Blacktown is pretty much it's just me. So out, out of t um, Tenant Connect and Telecross was born Teleyarn. And I've been doing it since about 2010, talking to the people having long chats with them and trying to keep them on the service and settle them into the service because they're not talking to Aboriginal people. I was the, I'm the only Aboriginal um, employer in Blacktown. So this was the birth of Teleyarn. So wh why it works, I think it's because it's culturally appropriate for our Aboriginal people and, and Torres Strait Islanders. The volunteers are of the same culture, so they've got the same interest. When we first began the phone calls, and Amy can um, tell you this too, the length of the calls would only be for about, oh, five minutes was a long one. And now that they've got a trust with the volunteers and they're talking to them, some of the phone calls go up to 60 minutes. And this is where we built, build the connection and the trust between the volunteers and our people. Um, sorry, I'm a bit nervous because I don't do this sort of thing. Um, the connection between the, the clients and the volunteer has grown, it's a trust thing. Knowing that they're having a yarn to another black fella is really important to them. And having a good laugh, and with a good laugh promotes good health. We share our life experiences in different ways we've been brought up and grew up. Sharing information about what's going on in our own communities and how different they are. And our connection to our land. I think knowing that they're talking to another um, Aboriginal person on the other end, it, it helps them because they ask for help. They might want help with Centrelink payments. They want to know what to do with their grandkids. They might want home care. They don't know how to do all these sort of things. They might want some organisation that can help them do um, a social connection to communities and things like that. So they're all the things we go through. One of the clients I put on the service he was part of the stolen generation. His name is Norm. Then when Norm realised that he was talking to another black fella, he said, I'll only talk to you because I'm part of the stolen generation. I don't trust these white, sorry, gubbers. I don't trust them, so I'll talk to you. So me and um, Norm we would talk for quite a long time. And actually, I wouldn't talk. He would talk. It was like a debriefing session for him, which he needed. And as time's gone on, Norm's got comfortable with talking with one of the other um, male volunteers, Brian, so he talks to him. So it's quite important to, um, for Norm that he is talking to another Aboriginal person. With my volunteers, I've got a beautiful bunch of volunteers, I've got six. They have a passion to talk to their elderly people. Um, and the difference between Teleyarn and Telechat is our, vol our clients are not locked into a scheduled call. So if they're home, they're home. If they're not, we'll call them again later on. And we'll leave a message that we call. Majority of times I'll ring back to say I missed your call. We run our um, Teleyarn out of um, Blacktown office, out of the call centre. 
Be the reasons are because most of our clients are on pre prepay phones, mobile, so it'd be too expensive for volunteers to ring them from home, and also we haven't got enough um, volunteers to do that. I'll give you one example of one lady. She gets telecross calls in the morning. Then when we rang her in the afternoon, she was from Taree, and they had a lot of bad weather up there, and a tree had come down just about over her house. And she said oh, to us, oh, you're a black fella, you know what it's like talking to gubbers. She said, do you think you can help me? The tree's coming down over my house and I don't know what to do. So we had to ring the SES in Taree and get a tree cut down. So there's some of the things that we go through, yeah. So we're going to do sort of a, bit, a bit of an interview with um, Amy and Elvis about what the service is like. So I'm going to talk to Amy and um, Elvis about what they get out of Teleyarn. Hello? Yep. Amy has been one of our first volunteers and um, some people say a rough diamond but I say a blue diamond. Amy's beautiful. Everybody loves Amy. Amy, how did you become a volunteer with Teleon? I was at work and... Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I was working at the Doonside Cottage. And I was doing Aboriginal artwork with Uncle Danny Eastwood and I was a volunteer worker there. And I, I run a youth program we did after our school. And I end up giving it up to look after my partner who was dying. And then when I lost him Christmas Day 2011, I felt like I couldn't do anything and I kept going over to the Cooley Outreach and that's how I met Deb and we all sit around the table and I was down and depressed and I said, no, I, I've got to do something otherwise I'm going to lose the plot and I was talking to Deb and, and I said, I need to get back into volunteer work instead of sitting at home depressed looking at four walls. And that's when Deb said, if I wanted to do volunteer, I could. And I said, yes. So as a volunteer with the Red Cross and doing telly yarn, what do you get out of doing this? I get out of it, like, because I do my calls, I'm help, not only helping myself, but I'm healing myself by talking to other people owing up. I do. Okay. Do you think this service helps your people? And how, how, how would it help them? Yeah, it does because we talk about how, how culture and how, like, background and what we do and, you know, and we all gather in a circle thing and... And I think, think with a lot of your clients too, they also say to you, like, ring me next week, hey? Yeah. <laughs> ring me, ring me, Amy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. If, if a non-Aboriginal person was making this call, do you think it would have the same outcome? No. Nah. Why not? Because they're different, they don't know what our background is that, you know, we talk about stolen generation and all and that. The, li the lingo's got a lot to yeah, do with it, eh? the lingo and... Black yeah, fella talk. Black fella talk and, you know. Oh, good. So, Amy, do you think you could share a story about one of the clients that you've spoken to over the phone and that might have had an impact on you? Yes, I was ringing this fella Rick up and I found out he he was working with my husband when they were younger, like in the shearing, and and he knew a lot about my partner, and that 
like got me out of the shell. And I thought, wow, this is fantastic. Finally talking to somebody who knew my partner, you know. And then that fella passed away and that had a big impact on me too. Amy's matched with quite a lot of um, her clients now. At first, when we started, we were hit and miss trying to work out personalities too and points of interest. So Amy's pretty much got her clients that she rings, the same as Vicky down there who helps us out. She's got her clients. So I'm going to um, have a talk to Elvis now. Hi, Elvis. <laughs> okay, how did you become a client of Telian? Uh, when Deb came to our illness group in Redfern, yeah. In Redfern, which is called Wyanga, and she came in and explained about the tele yarn and the Red Cross and that to us, and asked if we wanted to. I explained everything, what goes on with it, and then I decided to sign up with them. At first, I felt a bit reluctant to do it, but then, because I'm going, I was, I'm going through a hard time at the moment, a really hard time with depression, and. And, um, Thank you, John. Yeah. That's, that's good. Okay. And when they spoke to me to ring you that, uh, to we got someone to talk to you and that, and I felt really good inside when I said knew the, that there was somebody out there that could help me through it, to, you know, someone to talk to all the time, and I, which I talked to Amy a lot every Monday, <laughs> and she's good. And then, but it, it was good to have the telly yarn people to 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 really talk to to talk to me and that and. And I felt like I've, I'm sorry about this year, but I felt I felt really good. They got me out of out of Sydney now and everything, and brought me down here to meet all these beautiful people, which they are. And yeah. I'm sorry. Well, I know, I know myself. I was going to yeah. ask Elvis this, but you, you take time and have a, have a breather. Um, I suppose one of the questions I ask, is the service culturally appropriate and does it meet the needs of, the, of our people? And I know, I know it does because we've been doing it for so long and we keep getting asked, like, don't forget to ring me back next week. And it's also the length of the calls. And, and it's the kinship that we've built between the clients of the, of the Red Cross and the volunteers. Like, it's, it's a beautiful service and I really think every other state should take it on. And it's worth investing in our elders. Nobody should be that lonely. And I think with the elders, there's a lot of elders abuse that goes on. You hear of them getting their pension taken off and by their grandkids. There's no food there. Um, they, they rack up bills on them. Like, like There's just a lot of abuse. And with, with a lot of the um, elders, because they've been intimidated and stood over and abused for so long, they cut themselves off and they don't know what services are out there any longer. So I think that's one of the good things about Teleyarn, that, that we do do that, put them back into contact and support them as much as we can with the manpower that we've got. And I know that they're all appreciated because they love their calls. And we're at this stage we have, um, I think, 86 that we ring all, 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 every, every week if we can get through them. Obviously some are not home because they're at doctor's appointments or in hospital. Are you OK to yeah. go on? Yeah. OK. Do you think Teleyarn helps you build a relationship between yourself and the Aboriginal volunteers? I think you pretty much answered all that. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it does. And like I said, Teleyarn, I, I think it's the greatest thing that could happen to, to the Aboriginal community, to talk to people, you know, to talk to their own people. and They know that their own people are at the end of that line that they're talking to. So Teleyarn is, is really, really great. Mm. And, and so do you think the volunteers, like, I know, I know you have a lot to do with Amy, yeah. and, um, and I know you've spoken to Vicky a couple of times, but do you think they, they listen to you when you talk, or do you, do you think they turn off all...? No, they really listen to, to what, what I have to say, and, and I'll listen to what they to, when they talk to me and that. And do you think, like, if you ask the, 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 the volunteers on the other end of the line, if they could help you with a request, it might be with some sort of help or support, that they'd try and help direct you in the right direction or they could al allocate on your behalf? Do you think they're willing to do that? Yeah, they helped me a lot through that. They, they put me in the right direction in it to 
give me contacts with people, organise other organisations, you know, such as housing and... Well, I think we'd like to share, like Vicky, you know, would you like to share a story now about what you, your calls are like? I was getting out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, gee, I could share many stories, but one, I guess, is that Deb and I deal with um, um, a few that have high really needs. high needs with depression. And, um, for example, one client the other week I rang and I've just... Hi Pam, how are you? And it was whack straight at the at the at the initial opening of the call, and I've gone wow. And I've just talked her through. Well, after 42 minutes of talking to her, she was laughing and happy at the end of it, and looking forward to the next call. So, um, but yeah, there's many um, great calls that you do. Really, it's a it's a rewarding job. Um, every client's different, um, their needs are all different, but um, at the end of the day, it's, um, it's a rewarding job. We, yeah. we have a cl client, his name's John, and he's, he's a Brew Warrener boy, and he moved down to Sydney, and he lost contact with some kinship, like, like family and, and friends when he moved to Sydney, and he's gone, oh, geez, you know, I haven't seen Auntie Marge and the girls and that for so long. And I said, well, what's Annie Marge's last name? And he told her. And I went, oh, yeah, I know Annie Marge. She's on Telecross too and Tele Yarn. So <laughs> after 12 years, he's been in contact with them. And he rang me up the other day and said, oh, thanks for doing that, Deb. He said, like, now, now I'm in contact with them all the time. I ring them once a week and I've been out to see them. So there's some of the things that, like, Tele Yarn does, how it reconnects people back to their people and land and community. So... That's about... But I have to say one more thing. Out at, out at Tenet Connect, Teleyan and that, we've got a deadly elders group called the Wakara Aboriginal Elders and we've got about 20 of them and we're just getting inundated with things to do and we've been out to Juna Perina to see the young girls in, in Lockham, in Juvenile Justice. Aboriginal girls in there are running at 80%. 30% of them are under 12 years old. So we're going out as like aunties. So that's pretty sad, eh? I think your babies could be in that situation. Thank you. Please. Just before you go, um, I, I think it warrants a very special thank you. I know we've just had it and a very warm welcome to you and a very warm thanks to you. Um, those of us who jump up on stage, you know, three times a week and get used to it over your working life don't realise how difficult it can be. Um, I can't like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even Deb, who, uh, you know, works with us and gets on the phone and can yarn to anybody, uh, finds it a little intimidating. Um, but for um, Elvis and Amy, I think it's their first time in Melbourne as well. So um, for the effort that they've made to come out here and to speak to you and to share with you, their experience and the value of something that, you know, I don't think any of us probably fully appreciate. I certainly didn't. And the ability, perhaps, for this to be taken to other places and other states, and not just, in, not just in Australia. I've spent some time in the Pacific recently, and we're all looking to develop those national societies throughout the Pacific, and each of them is looking for ways that they can develop services to meet the needs of people in their, um, in their um, communities. And they're looking for no-cost, low-cost ways of dealing with those issues. And I think, Deb, you're to be absolutely uh, congratulated for um, coming up with something so authentic, so valuable, so low-cost, um, so able to be um, scaled up and moved into other places. And um, to see that it's, uh, you know, the value that it's had and um, for the people, the people that are here with us and for people who start out on one end of the phone and end up on the other end of the phone, um, that's, that's absolutely fantastic as well. So we're deeply grateful to you, um, um, Amy, Elvis, and Vicky as well, for coming and joining with us today. And I ask you one more time to show your warm appreciation. Thank you. Amy, yeah. I just want to say a big thank you once again. And also it's mine and Elvis. First time, 
We're burning on a fly. Yeah. <laughs> Woo -hoo. <laughs> She's getting used to that mic now, eh? <laughs> that's fantastic. I knew that. First time on a plane, first time in Melbourne. Um, that's terrific, and we've been honoured to have you here with us as guests. Thank you so much. Okay, well, I told you to be rich, and we're, um, we're going to move on to, to Dr. Paul Morgan, Director of Communications and Online, with SANE, one of uh, uh, um, Australia's um, national mental health organisations. Um, now, you know, we talk about people who are first-timers and we t talk about people who do this not once a week, not twice this week, not three times this week, but for the fourth time this week at a conference helping to share the work of SANE. Uh, I give you Dr. Paul Morgan. Thanks, Paul. Come and join us. Huh? Thanks for that. And I would like to thank the Red Cross especially for asking, asking us to, uh, to come along today to, to take part in your, uh, your wonderful 100-year celebration. And uh, yes, it was worth coming to hear, hear you guys talking about Tele Yarn. It was uh, very moving. Now, I'm going to start by just reading out some, uh, some names for you. If I can work out how to use a machine. Okay, now, uh, I'm sure some of you will re uh, recognize some of these names, if not all of them. And there's a lot of them. Larundel, Mont Park, Q, Beechworth, Ararat, Greylands, Claremont, Whitby Falls, Yarra Bend, it goes on. Lakeside, the Carlton Lunatic Asylum, Hillsmere, Royal Park, Briley, Thomas Embling, Castle Hill, Callan Park, Gladesville, Morissette, Port Macquarie, Glenside, Hillcrest, Woolston Park, and that's not all of them. All of these, until pretty recently, were the many psychiatric institutions, the old mental asylums in Australia. By the second half of the 20th century, there were over 40 asylums or mental institutions in Australia. That is an extraordinary number. They all had probably a couple of thousand people in them. Now you consider the population of Australia in the early part of the 20th century, when these places had already been established, was about three or four million. So with a bit of counting on my fingers, I, I worked out probably one to two percent of the entire population was locked up in mental asylums in, for a lot of Australia's history in the 19th and early 20th century. Locked away pretty much permanently for the rest of their lives behind high walls, never spoken about or only talked about in whispers, even amongst their families. Now, how many of you have heard, as, as I certainly have, uh, being with an elderly relative, looking at old photographs, and she'd say, that's your great aunt Elizabeth when she was young. They had to take her away, you know. We didn't talk about her after that. So common. Who were these tens of thousands of people? Well, certainly some of them had intellectual disability. Some of them would have had autism. There would have been people with dementia. There would have been people with epilepsy. And we do know of tragic cases in the records where women were locked away for many years, possibly for the rest of their lives, for moral intemperance. Uh, in other words, for being spirited and uh, promiscuous. Strangely, there are no records of any men being locked up for, for similar reasons. But the great proportion of the uh, inhabitants of the mental asylums did have mental illnesses that today we call by names such as schizophrenia, 
bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, and, and dozens of other conditions. They didn't have effective treatments for them in those days. They were simply locked away for life. Now, even when people don't have effective treatments, such as medications, you can still treat them humanely and do what you can. Life in some of the institutions could be benevolent and a retreat from the hurly-burly of society at times. I know at, uh, at Beechworth, in the old asylum there, they had a farm, they had milking sheds, they grew their own vegetables, um, there were orchards. For some of the people, for some of the time, it could be quite a peaceful retreat. It could also be pretty inhumane and pretty degrading. I know myself, uh, a friend of mine is a psychiatric nurse who, when he first started working, was at Beechworth. This would have been back in the, the 60s, early 70s. And he said, shower time for the, uh, the people in the wards at Beechworth Mental Institution were to bring them out in the yard and turn the fire hoses on them because that got them clean. So we're not just talking about the 19th century here. But in any case, what they all shared was a shutting out from society, which pretended that they didn't exist or didn't want to accommodate them or didn't know how to accommodate them. Now, over the past, past few decades, with, with uh, medications improving to a degree, most of those psychiatric hospitals have been closed down. But I'm sure they, they still live on in the memories of people in this room as, as, as well as in uh, culture generally. People who would have been shut away with them now mostly live in the community. They live at home. They may live with aging parents. There's a whole bulge of baby boomers with, with schizophrenia in their 50s and 60s living with and being looked after parents in their 80s. And I know of one case, a mother in her 90s, who still does the washing for her 60-year-old son with schizophrenia. They live in boarding houses. They live in prisons in far too great numbers. And in some cases, they live on the street. But to a great degree, though, despite these changes, society's attitudes towards the mentally ill persist, that these people are crazy, that they're unpredictable, that they may be violent, that they're comical, that they're not the same as other people, and they're not deserving of the same respect as other people, even if they behave in strange ways sometimes because of their symptoms. In other words, they're not the same as us. And this is what we call stigma. It's the ignorance and the attitudes that we have towards people who don't fit our particular group in society's idea of normal. And I'm sure this has echoes in other groups um, who are attending this conference today. In some ways, our society is becoming a lot more tolerant of difference. But for schizophrenia and other chronic, severe mental illnesses, there is still an attitude of, of misunderstanding and ignorance and fear, which is often encouraged by the media. Now, this stigma operates unconsciously, like, like other forms of prejudice. It's, it's a gut reaction against people that we feel are, are different and, and, and worrying. And it covers many aspects of, of, of life. There are ordinary attitudes uh, in the community towards these people, um, and we see it fairly regularly when there's uh, perhaps a halfway house opening on a street and people don't want neighbours who've got schizophrenia talking to themselves, walking down the street. We see it in the media. We see it in health professionals, strangely enough, because a lot of people report that doc uh, psychiatrists and mental health nurses they will often only see people when they're really acutely ill, and that's the picture that they have of them. So strangely, it's among health professionals that you see some of the most um, quite you know, unrealistic ideas about, uh, and prejudiced ideas about people with a mental illness. We see it in, amongst bureaucrats who are doing service planning. 
We see it in, in the legislature. Now, we will all remember the recent uh, battles over the Abbott government attempting to revoke uh, Section 18C of the Discrimination Act um, so that people um, who are from different cultures could be freely insulted by bigots. Our hope in recent years was that people with a disability, especially mental illness, could be added to this group. But no, um, they may not have rescinded 18C, but it's still perfectly legal on mainland Australia, everywhere except Tasmania, it's perfectly legal to publicly insult and denigrate and belittle and demean people with a mental illness and a disability, and it's perfectly lawful and it's perfectly outrageous. And a final most harmful form of, uh, of stigma, I believe, is self-stigma, is when people internalize it. Because when you develop a mental illness, usually in your late teens, you're not different to anyone else. You don't, because you're getting an illness, doesn't mean you understand it or know about it. So very often, people will develop a condition, they're as ignorant about it as other people, they have the same mistaken ideas about it. So they'll very often resist, and they'll resist seeking treatment because they don't want to be seen as one of them. Um, and the longer that treatment's delayed, the worse uh, the outcomes usually are. And it can also lead to people being, perceiving themselves as, as victims, uh, as that they're just um, beset by this terrible illness and there's nothing they can do about it. So we have this large proportion of the population of Australians and their families who are invisible uh, and disregarded by society at large. We often hear the uh, statistic that one in five of Australians every year is affected by mental illness. It seems too, far too high to many people, but believe me, it's, it's true. Uh, this is from very deep research that, that's been done by universities, by the um, Institute of Health and Welfare, um, by the ABS. The large proportion of those people are affected by depression, by anxiety, disorders, um, and a lot of those are not getting the treatment they need. But around one or two percent of the entire population Strangely, the same proportion of those people who were locked up in the institutions 100 years ago, they have severe ongoing conditions such as schizophrenia, other psychotic conditions, uh, and other mental illnesses that really need ongoing support and understanding. So the impact is huge. Stigma leads to discrimination. It leads to self-stigma, to people believing they have no worth, and it discourages help-seeking. So what's to be done about it? Well, we've seen some improvements in attitudes to depression in recent years, thanks to the work of, of Beyond Blue and others. But very, just when you think things are improving, these ideas bubble up from, from people's unconscious again, and um, you see the old attitudes coming through. As we did this week in, in Mark Latham's article in the Financial Review that you might have heard about, um, where he, he denigrated uh, mothers with um, perinatal depression uh, as being weak for taking antidepressants. I don't really have much to say about that. Um, also in the area of the media, uh, SANE operates and has done for some years what we call our Stigma Watch program, which works, which monitors and educates the, uh, the media about how to cover mental illness and suicide. And again, we've seen real improvement in this over the years. Um, we really think we're making a difference here and, and educating the media, not just uh, criticising them all the time. But again, as always, just when you think things are improving, an issue bubbles up, and in the last few weeks, we've had a, a headline in the Courier Mail in Brisbane, which I swear to God, it was this high, the letters, Psycho Gigolo, um, about a, a dreadful case of, of murder. But the newspapers love the spice of um, the people who are involved in it. And it was a dreadfully sad, uh, violent case. And all they could turn it into was some kind of uh, freak show, freak show headline, psycho gigolo. Um, even in the Australian, that, that pillar of our society, um, we've been in close contact with them this week because for several days in a row, they had large headline stories on the front page 
about um, the high rates of suicide amongst Aboriginal people uh, and highlighted a particular case of a, an Aboriginal boy um, who'd taken his own life. The Australian's got a long history, whatever you think of its politics, it's, it's had a long history of uh, talking about Aboriginal issues and we commend them for that. But they went too far and they gave a lot of detail about how this young man had taken his own life, which was certainly not helpful to his family. Um, and from research, we know that when vulnerable people read about suicides and there's a method given, it can trigger people to use the same method. And research has shown that's the case. And um, what's, that's what we're uh, meeting with the Australian and News Limited about um, in the coming weeks. So when we look at what makes a difference, it's New Zealand and the UK, and especially Scotland, which have led the way in changing attitudes. In both countries, for, for over 10 years now in New Zealand, they've had these multi-year campaigns with a commitment of funding from the government, uh, using the media to educate people, to introduce uh, stories of people who've uh, experienced mental illness, but also encouraged a lot of bottom-up local activities so that people can meet people who've uh, experienced mental illness. Because again, uh, what the research tells us is that when you, it's people who know least about a culture or another group of people who are the most prejudiced about it. And just meeting other human beings and seeing that they don't have horns and tails and that they're just regular folk like the rest of us, um, that, that's the most powerful thing you can do to extinguish prejudice and stigma. One of the schemes they had in New Zealand was, um, I wasn't quite sure about it myself, but they had a, um, in the local libraries as well as books and CDs, they had someone with a mental illness that you could borrow with your library card and they would tell you the story of their life. And that, that it got into the newspapers, that's for sure, but it was, um, it was strangely powerful because there's nothing like meeting people and hearing them tell their yarns that makes a big difference. So it's this kind of grassroots as well as national media campaigning that, that's going to really work in Australia if anything's going to, uh, to change attitudes and get rid of stigma. Um, what we need is uh, this top-down campaign with a commitment for government for years, and this is what we're, we're telling them over and over again, um, that will educate people about the facts of mental illness, but also uh, it's got to be grassroots as well so that people ha are given the opportunity to meet other people because to be truly mentally healthy as a society, it means accepting those who are affected by mental illness as equally deserving of respect as everyone else. And after all, I'm sure that every single person in this room today, if you haven't experienced a mental health problem yourself, you will certainly have a family member somewhere who has, or you've got a friend who's been affected. So mental illness and stigma, it's not about them, it's not about those people, it's about us. Thank you. Share a mic for a minute. Um, his reward for finishing up a little early is that he gets to take some questions. <laughs> um, so I'm, yeah, well look, People straight out of the blocks. Yes, please. Actually, I just have a, a small tale I'd like to share rather than a question sure. um, that seems to uh, resonate with a lot you of can, what... You can tell me a yarn with a microphone. Yes, it seems to resonate a lot with what you're saying. Um, in 2004, I was recruited as full-time executive assistant to the CEO of Anglicare South Australia. A month later, I had an epileptic seizure and was summ summarily dismissed. Um, the hardest thing about it was actually the fact that it was done in such a savage, confronting way, as if it was all my fault and so forth, that it put me into a kind of a shock where I could not speak for myself. I retreated into a silence that took several months to emerge from. and. Uh, that's my simple tale, and I think it says, it speaks volumes in some ways. Yes, that's the, that's the very reason I mentioned it. 
it's when we, um, and it's, it's much wider than mental illness, that um, we all live unconsciously in the little tribes of people who are like us, and people outside that are, are um, distrusted and feared, and we don't want anything to do with that because um, we run a program for, for employers called, called uh, Mindful Employer where we go into the workplace, we, we go along with people who've experienced mental illness and we talk to them in the workplace about what it's like to have that, that experience uh, as well as providing lots of you know, legal and human resources um, advice as well on how to, how to work with people th through an episode of mental illness so that they can retain them as employees rather than just act like frightened horses and think, oh, we've got to kick this person out because we don't know how to deal with it and it's going to cause, cause problems. So that's helping people not to knee-jerk in that way is, is a large part of what we do. Sorry? We'll have to leave it at that. That's fine. Thanks, Paul. Um, look, thank, th thank you. <laughs> yes. um, the relevance or in additional relevance of that comment, I think, is, you know, you go to work one day, something happens, and it, you know, you can never predict it. It can happen to anybody. Any one of us, any one of our relatives can be in that position, not necessarily terminated in such a brutal way, but then having to deal with the consequences of that and the stigma attached to that. So, Paul, thank you for drawing that out. I, I, on a lighter note, I note when you started reading out all those names at the beginning and you went along through the list and then you came to the Carlton Lunatic Asylum, and I thought he must have been referring to the Red Cross headquarters there in, uh, <laughs> in Carlton for a minute. Um, but I do think that, um, and it reminded me then of my, my journey to work each morning. I walk 15 minutes through the streets of Carlton to get to the office and i am generally got my headphones in and my, I'm making phone calls on my way to work and I'm talking away uh, out there, just chatting away. And I think the mobile phone might make some bit of a contribution towards reducing the stigma because now everybody walks the streets talking to themselves or at least apparently talking to themselves. Um, the challenge that you put forward about the, uh, the um, impact of stigma, I think, um, addresses us both on a, an individual level, as what, I, what, you know, we're part of that, perhaps part of that stigma, one side of it, but also then the challenges for us in society, what we can do, and I am a great admirer of your um, stigma watch. Um, I know in New South Wales, uh, some people introduced the Ernie Awards, and that was to expose sexism. Uh, and they had a series of awards each year for the most sexist comment from a politician or from uh, somebody else. And it has really brought it out into the public about uh, how outrageous. So I think this stigma watch is a very, very good to open way of, of exposing the way people attribute and, uh, stigma. Because as you point out, the symptoms of mental illness and the, the experience that people have is bad enough but the stigma is often a lot worse. So we join with you in, in trying to address that. And thank you very much for your work and thank you for joining with us today. We really appreciate it. Okay, James, we're over to James. Now we're gonna jump up to Townsville. James has flown many times and he's flown down here before. Uh, he's with us today. Um, he's our regional manager in North Queensland. It's not his hometown, but he's doing some brilliant work there and he's here to tell you all about it. You don't need to hear from me. Thank you, James. Good afternoon and thank you for having me here today. Um, I need to make a, <clears throat> a brief apology about the, uh, the introduction of this session. Uh, I was asked uh, by Red Cross uh, to make it a bit sexy so that people would be attracted to it. And I was very busy at the time and threw it together and hit the send button and only looked at it again yesterday and thought, mm bit preemptive because I've said from dysfunctional service system to successful collective impact. Um, the successful might be a bit of a stretch at this stage. We're certainly on the path to successful collective impact, but not quite there yet. So you can cross that bit out. Um, I'm really pleased that we've got these because I was worried about, uh, you know, someone sneaking into the room and giving me heaps for, for poor microphone technique uh, after yesterday's <laughs> session. Um, uh, look, after yesterday, uh, we had a couple of brilliant sessions on collective impact, so I've rewritten my presentation um, because you don't need to hear the theory of it again. Uh, but I'm going to take you through um, just a, a bit of a journey uh, from a process perspective about um, how we've moved from what was a highly dysfunctional uh, service system, homelessness service system in Townsville, 
uh, to what is now a much better integrated um, service for our clients. Um, and I, I won't talk a lot about the benefits to clients as we go through, but I, I need to say up front that the whole purpose of this journey is about getting a better deal, uh, much better outcomes for one of the most socially disadvantaged and excluded groups of people in our community. So, um, just a, a bit of background. Uh, there, are, there are currently 13 uh, organisations funded uh, to deliver about 60 programs, homelessness programs in Townsville. Um, Townsville receives the largest uh, amount of homelessness funding outside of Brisbane in Queensland. Uh, so currently $13 million a year is spent on uh, homelessness issues in Townsville. So it's a lot of money. Um, it's a particular lot of money if it's not being, if not being very well used. Um, we, Red Cross runs three homelessness services, the three largest homelessness services in Townsville. So we run the Street to Home Assertive Outreach Program, uh, which is looking at people who are rough sleeping, and many of those people have been rough sleeping for um, you know, anything from three to 30 years. And uh, many of those people have um, uh, chronic addiction issues, uh, sometimes combined with mental health issues and physical health uh, issues, uh, so they're, they're a very distressed, uh, s reasonably small but distressed group of people. Uh, we run a homestay early intervention program which is about keeping a roof over the heads of people who've already got a home um, and we run uh, the homelessness hub service which is our most recent uh, service in Townsville. So that's a hub where anyone who's at risk of homelessness or actually homeless can come in um, and be provided with a service. Um, <clears throat> when I joined Red Cross uh, in 2012, I, I came to Red Cross from the Department of Housing as the Regional Manager for Housing in North Queensland. So I had a very solid and sound understanding of uh, the homelessness and the housing service systems in the region um, and uh, a, a good idea of how um, how well they worked and sometimes didn't work. Um, <coughs> so one of, the, one of the reasons I moved to Red Cross was the opportunity to be part of the solution uh, rather than sit on the sidelines and whinge about uh, what wasn't doing, what wasn't going particularly well. And Red Cross was the perfect, uh, perfect place uh, to start um, ac active change. So our brand helps us in these circumstances, um, even though the smaller not-for-profit agencies in Townsville are quite uh, anxious, still quite anxious about the large NGOs coming to town and uh, swallowing them up and taking them over. Um, because I had long-standing trust relationships built within the Housing and Homelessness Service System Leadership Group previously, uh, there's a level of trust automatically extended uh, and we've proven over the last uh, almost three years that that trust is well-based and well-founded uh, because we are working very well together. Not all of us, but most of us. Um, about two years ago, uh, when we got the third service, one of the expectations of the funder was that we, uh, Red Cross, would take uh, a leadership role in service integration that's a difficult thing for a not-for-profit agency to do when you're working with other not-for-profit agencies. So it was well known uh, in the funders' ranks that, that the service system wasn't working particularly well and that clients weren't getting the best outcomes they possibly could. So we accepted that role. We did point out that that would need to be an informal role because we had no power or authority to change the way that services uh, decided they were going to behave or act or deliver their service. Um, but what we did initially was, was pull, we invite um, all of the leaders of all homelessness and housing services together. We talked to them about the theory of collective impact. We highlighted uh, international and national research about the value of working in partnership, uh, about the value of um, that, that whole collective impact model, that if you want to change, uh, if you want to make a difference to a significant social issue in your community, um, 
individual agencies are never going to be able to do that by themselves, unless you know they all wanted to hand their money over to Red Cross and we would just do it for them. That's never going to happen. Um, as a result of that, we, we formed a, a leadership group, a leadership network. Uh, we also formed a service integration uh, network. So uh, the people at service coordinator team leader level uh, come together every month. Um, they find out much more, as much as they possibly can, about other services operating in the service system. Uh, they also bring to the table uh, problems uh, in terms of access to services, access to brokerage funding, uh, the, the, the deal that their clients are getting or not getting through the homelessness hub service. Um, and those things can be worked through and be, are being worked through. We also established a case coordination group. Uh, so at the case manager level, uh, people come together on a weekly basis. They bring de-identified cases together uh, to, to the table and work through them. And uh, I guess an example of the type of thing that happens is you know, Red Cross, uh, Red Cross case worker will come to the table and say, We've, these were the initial goals that we worked through with our client. Um, we've been working with the client for six months. We've achieved the first goal, but really second, third, and fourth goals were kind of not really hitting, hitting the mark, and we've run out of ideas on how to, how to make that happen. Um, should we be working uh, with other agencies? Should we even be providing the lead uh, for this particular client with these issues? Uh, does someone else have any idea? That you, is anyone else already working with them that we don't know about? All of those sorts of things. That's working particularly well. Last um, October, after I'd been banging on about collective impact and consortium models uh, for 12 months, five other, uh, five smaller agencies approached me and asked if Red Cross would be interested in forming and uh, being, being part of a consortium of housing and homelessness services, and would we be interested in becoming the lead agency for those service, those, that consortium? Um, of course, I said yes. Um, I, I sometimes now think maybe I should have paused and thought about that, thought that through a little bit better, but um, uh, we're in the journey now, and it's, uh, it, we've been going for over 12 months. Um, we have, uh, we worked solidly uh, at least one day a week, sometimes two or three days a week, uh, as leaders of those six agencies uh, for three months to get a legally binding uh, consortium agreement established and put in place. Um, now that agreement um, identified uh, Red Cross as the lead. There's a significant power imbalance uh, between Red Cross and smaller agencies and still that anxiety about being swallowed up so we worked very hard in the consortium agreement to try and address that imbalance um, and make sure that uh, Red Cross couldn't make arbitrary decisions about uh, where the funding was going to go or, you know, oh, we've decided that, you know, we're going to run that service ourselves. We're not going to, you know, not going to contract with any of you to, to deliver that service. We can't do that. So we're legally bound through that agreement uh, not to be able to do those sorts of things. Red Cross can never chair the, the consortium board uh, so we've tried to address, uh, address the imbalance as much as we possibly can. Um, we've, uh, as soon as, uh, one of the critical things here is that, and one of the things that astonished me early on was every single one of those agencies was prepared and their, their, their own boards and steering committees had signed off on the fact that, uh, that they would hand their funding, all of their homelessness funding over to Red Cross to manage and that we would then subcontract that funding uh, back to them in some way, shape or form. Not necessarily the amount that they've been funded previously and not necessarily for the same kind of activities, but they would be uh, subcontracted by Red Cross uh, to deliver a range of services that we all agreed, agreed needed to be delivered. In line with that, we, um, we also wrote, uh, we tried to get ahead of the sector reform uh, process so we, uh, we developed a sector reform proposal and delivered that to the Minister for Housing and Homelessness um, and also to the Department of Housing. Um, they love the work that we're doing. Uh, we're doing everything, uh, covering off on everything that they could possibly ask for. 
one of the key things the Minister had uh, asked us previously was to make sure that at the end of the day there were fewer services being, uh, fewer services delivering service at the end of the day, uh, so they wanted fewer actually delivering. Um, that there was a, a lead agency who would be the single contract manager for homelessness funding in Townsville, and that we could quantitatively prove that we were um, reducing back of house and administrative expense, and that those savings would be going to additional services for clients. So we've managed to do that. Um, well, in our proposal, we've managed to do that, and. Uh, we're, we're still waiting to hear about the success or otherwise of the sector reform proposal. Um, we've, uh, we've put two tenders in, uh, Red Cross as lead agency for the consortium. Uh, we're waiting on the results of those, but we think that this is a bit of a, this is our test. Uh, we're quite confident about at least one of them and, we, and we're reasonably confident about both of them. Um, now that won't necessarily uh, bring additional business to Red Cross, um, so in fact there's a lot more work for Red Cross in doing the contract management and the reporting to the funder and all of those sorts of things, um, but the, the aim is not necessarily about building additional business, it's about getting a better deal for clients. Um, we're in the process of negotiating, because we, ha we have one physical hub where the homelessness hub service is located and our other homelessness and family support services are in the same building. Um, within that service, we, uh, we've negotiated for other services to operate from that location. So Centrelink, um, a homeless persons legal clinic, the Department of Housing, um, a family emergency accommodation in Townsville, the Women's Centre, uh, share House Youth Accommodation Program, all operate staff out of that service so that people don't have to physically go from service to service and tell their story all over again. Um, we're in the process of negotiating uh, a lease for a second physical hub in Townsville, so it'll be about uh, 10 kilometres away from the first one and it will be located in, in a major service um, and transport hub in Townsville. So it will be much more accessible than the one that we currently have in the city and we think that that will be the busier physical location. We're looking at duplicating um, all of those uh, same services. There'll be five of the six agencies co-located in that new hub service. That's one of the ways that we're reducing back of house expenses. Um, what the major housing provider that we've got on board in the consortium has agreed to take on responsibility for the uh, HR, finance, budgeting, fleet, IT, property functions uh, for, Red Cross can't be involved in that of course, but for all five other agencies and thereby they don't need to keep uh, so quite so many administrative staff, save expen expenditure and put those into new services. So that's um, a bit about our journey. Uh, there isn't a lot of, uh, there's no time for questions. Uh, but I'll be around at the break if anyone's interested in talking that through further and, uh, and I can send you electronic copies of documents. Thanks. Thanks, James. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I do apologise. James got the short straw. He got a slightly so shorter session. Um, but look, that's very, um, very, very helpful. We heard in one of the other sessions earlier today about innovation and the four P's of innovation, um, process, product, people, paradigm. And here we have a process change, sh moving towards a new paradigm, which both, which all designed to innovate in order to get better outcomes for clients, better outcomes for homeless people, cheaper, better. So it's a terrific in innovation. Um, Red Cross, works in four areas to try and overcome social exclusion. Four areas of trying to build bridges back into community. For isolated older people, Aboriginal people in particular in that group, homeless people we've just heard about, um, people with mental illness we heard about earlier. And now we're going to move to the fourth area, which is prisoners, ex-prisoners and their families, the hidden, unnoticed, incarcerated people really. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Eamon and to Vi, as in Violet, to um, take over, give us this last fourth, fourth presentation. We're in Eamon's capable hands. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, good afternoon, everybody. 
Um, I'd like to um, introduce Vi Lotter uh, from our partner organization, Backroll. Um, and our session will be looking at social inclusion in the context of offenders and their families. And I guess the other thing that we'll uh, hopefully be demonstrating is the strong collaboration between the two organizations in the key areas that we have in common in Victoria. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation um, and pay my respects to elders past and present. To also acknowledge my Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues here today. Um, and uh, also just uh, acknowledge that it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here and to be part of the uh, Centenary Summit. Um, I'll allow Vi to introduce herself. Um, hi, my name is Vi, as Eamon said, and I just want to thank the Red Cross for inviting me to participate. Um, it's a real pleasure for VACRO to be involved, and uh, it's also, for me, um, a result of what I believe a good collegiate working relationship about making uh, the lives of our families of prisoners uh, much better. So we have up there our mission, and I'm not going to go through it. It's very clear what it stands for. I just want to address the second paragraph that we achieve this as leaders in partnership. And one of the partnerships, of course, is Red Cross, uh, which is currently working really well. Um, we are very proud um, to note that it's 142 years history of working in this space, and also that we're the first service to have recognized and include um, the families uh, still today, um, I'm not making political statements, but still today, the justice or the government doesn't fund the work around families of offenders. Uh, and this is an important part of how we work and where we work at any point in the life of the family or the client through the criminal justice system. Uh, we, we work, um, we have programs fitting into all of those areas. And of course, um, when, we, when we think of ourselves as Australian Red Cross, we know that um, we've got a policy statement that focuses on um, our, our commitment to improving the lives of individuals and families um, who are socially excluded or isolated as a result of their involvement in the justice system. We also have offenders and their families as a key strategic focus um, with Australian Red Cross um, in our current um, strategic area of overcoming disadvantage and will be a key part of our 2020 focus as we move forward um, in the coming years. We also recognize the role um, of the prison system in society and, and acknowledge that whilst the system exists, it can have some long-term impacts on those in prison, their families and the broader community. We also seek as an organization to contribute to a safer and more socially cohesive uh, community by looking at ways to divert people from crime, reducing rates of reoffending, and reintegrating offenders into the community where possible. Where our key focus is making communities safer, stronger, and more resilient. Okay, I guess as we celebrate our um, 100 year uh, anniversary this year, it's important that we also recognize our strong history and connection with offenders and their families right through our history. Uh, we've operated internationally in the um, prison and detention space uh, with a variety of roles and responsibilities. Uh, We've got our um, 189 uh, societies, which has that unique auxiliary to government role. We've got that key observation, humanitarian observation role in detention facilities and in some overseas prisons. And we also need to remember as we um, celebrate our 100 year anniversary that we did have a key role in the First World War um, looking at um, receiving and matching uh, tracing requests, which numbered almost five million at the time, and they were handwritten on cards. Uh, we also run a number of key programs and services across Australia. 
we've also been quite proactive in terms of advocating for different ways of um, utilizing the resources currently um, focused on justice and um, offending. We submitted to the Senate inquiry into the value of justice reinvestment approach um, to criminal justice in Australia just in March last year. As you know, justice re reinvestment is about channeling some of those funds to address the causes of crime and targeting the communities from which offenders um, come from, rather than just the, um, the institutes that um, is currently the main focus of that um, investment. Investing in peoples and communities um, to provide alternative ways. Um, investing in community building, family support, um, and early prevention. As some of you will know, Red Cross um, has a number of programs that fo uh, focuses on uh, offenders and their families. Um, we've got the prison support program in Tasmania, uh, which is peer support uh, by prisoners, for prisoners. We've got um, Food Sense, um, which is a nutritional education program for inmates, which has operated in WA. And we've also ha we also have Step Out, which um, is looking at um, uh, developing mentors to work with young offenders. Uh, which is currently operating in South Australia. Also, Talk Out Loud has been um, delivered in, um, in uh, detention and in prison facilities uh, in a number of states and territories. When we look at Victoria and the work that Australian Red Cross does in Victoria, um, one of our key program areas is the Prison Visitor Resource Centre. Um, and that's a focus on uh, a volunteer-led program that delivers personal and practical support uh, for people visiting a family member or a friend in prison. We also have utilized um, Save a Mate, uh, both um, in juvenile justice and in other um, high-risk areas across the state. Um, and we also have a program that engages with um, young offenders in the Melbourne Youth Justice Centre looking at uh, providing positive interactions through volunteers and offenders engaging in sport. It's your turn, Barbara. So predominantly, oh, should be standing under the mics. So predominantly, we're gonna be talking about, or oh, focusing on um, how we respond to the needs of vulnerable children and their families who come into contact with the criminal justice system and it covers social justice, social inclusion. And we do, um, underpinning our work, of course, is the rights of the child, as outlined in the UN Convention. And another area that underpins our clinical work is desist the desistance framework. Um, quite simple, in other words, desistance is desisting from crime and good family connections and family man relationship maintenance is a key factor in desistance. As in that earlier slide with the colourful dots where we work, this is how we work with the families as well. At every point they, they come into contact with the criminal justice system, FACRO has programmes uh, to assist and support them. And we like to call it not my crime, still my sentence, collateral damage, unintended victim, you get the, the picture. That's what these people are. They're not recognized as victims or efforts and energy is put into um, the victim of crime, rightly so, or there's an emphasis on the offender. But the families and the children are the forgotten victims. And you know, the question there is where does this fit? I will leave that up to you. Where do the families and children fit for you to think about? Early on in my introduction, I didn't say that I am actually, I have a, what do you call it, an identity. I am what back home would be called a coloured South African. So for being part of the social inclusion presentation, it's really important to me to work the way I work is important to me, not from my academic background or my professional background, but it has deep roots in my personal history. And I couldn't go by without, of course, acknowledging what Nelson Mandela had to say. Um, how we treat our children is very important. And those are the, the dots that, or the, the little circles, and there's numerous circles that impact upon one child. Several children in our client group, but if you can visualize, you know, a child of two, nine, 
or 15, having all of those things that they have to bear. Most of them are adult concepts, and that's what we work with, uh, whether it is building, um, building resilience or addressing the trauma or keeping secrets. A lot of our little kids have to keep secrets, which is so unfair and hard for them. Um, of course, VACRO has done a lot of research in this area, and I'm not going to go through all the research. At the end of our presentation, there's a link. Please go to our website. There's lots of things there. But one of the ones I do want to talk about really briefly is something we did in 2009, um, which resulted in the first of its kind program in the world. And that's something we're very proud of, is that we have a worker in the Geelong Magistrate Court. So, you know, at the point of arrest, as I said earlier, we work at all points. So at the point of arrest, we have someone in the court who will support the families. And that came from the research. Might have, the research occurred in 2009. We finally got it off the ground with philanthropic funding in 2012-13. Um, that's what I've, I think I've just said. It's an international first program. So we can just move on. Anymore. And another research which occurred in 2011 is about looking at the next generation because, uh, you know, often there are family members in prison and their children end up offenders. I used to work in a clinical perspective for another organisation doing assessments and it was always interesting or not only interesting but quite, um, I don't know, um, it's touched me here, <laughs> not, not just academically or logically, is that I would see dads one year and maybe a few years later I'll see their sons in the prison or working around Fulham compound. There'd be a dad, an uncle or so. so this is what this research is, trying to uh, avoid that ongoing um, cycle. And then we combined, not combined, yeah, well, in some ways we did combine the two research, we linked it. Uh, and we found that one solution to the one bit of research is this family-based, uh, family-based, court family-based program. And it has had that impact because our work in the Geelong court is working with a lot of these children of people who are arrested. So we start in really early, it's about early intervention, getting hold of people who are vulnerable or kids who are vulnerable and trying to make a change in their lives. Oh. And this is another bit of research which we have and it's for families. So it's preparing families for when that member comes out or their loved one comes out of prison. So they have something to work with, they have some guidelines. Um, and again, you know, one of these phrases, we like banding around, not my crime, still my sentence. So in the Geelong court, uh, this was a mum, you know, she told her son that morning that I'm going to court. If I don't come home, I'm going to prison. Nothing in place. But that's what this 12-year-old was left. Our worker was able to pick him up as a client. And, you know, I'm pleased to say there's been some progress, but she's still working with him. But that's not an unusual case. That's you know, what she deals with on a daily basis. So these are just examples of the kind of clients we work with. And um, I'm not gonna go through it all, but I just wanna give you a little case study and I won't go through it all. Just recently, my counselor, my family counselor, children's counselor, uh, uh, worked with a, a young man, or not a young man, a young boy, he's nine, who grew up in a household um, you know, where drugs was the norm, dealing, and family violence. He frequently felt unsafe and learned to have a tough exterior in order to survive. Um, so we started working with him six months ago when his dad was incarcerated, and again for drug-related offences. At that time, his mum took him off or relocated to the grandparents' home. And uh, there's another chaotic household. And it, I thought about this, this is probably where Red Cross would come in because this grandparent, these grandparents would probably end up at the visitor centre where Red Cross would make them feel welcome and you know, support them through that uh, process. And grandparents do this a lot of having to support um, children, grandchildren, and take on new parenting roles. So having the Red Cross in the visitor centres uh, is a real bonus for them. Um, and then the school contacted our counsellor as well and said they were worried about this young boy's behaviour. You know, they were talking about bad behaviour, bullying and all of that. What they didn't get was that 
might be bad behavior, and, but it's actually trauma, trauma-influenced behavior, which the school didn't quite understand. So our counselor worked with the school, uh, and she also worked with this young boy. And he then wanted to meet his dad, he wanted to talk to his dad. And with lots of to and fro in the dad, finally six weeks agreed to that. And they met uh, in a counseling session in the school. So we've had this whole inclusion of getting the school community involved uh, as well. And they p played games, or my counselor initiated games to break that uncomfortableness because they've never had conversations. And you know, I mean, I can't imagine my child or my grandchild not having a conversation with a parent. That's just, you know, just not right. So this little boy had no experience of that. So to break the ice, she played celebrity heads with them and, you know, put other little things in that, get them talking. And that was really, really good. And it worked because they continued the conversation. And at the end, the young man wanted to continue talking to his dad. So it's all pretty unfamiliar for them, but they both expressed an interest to continue. So I think you know, that's the kind of work we have to deal with in this multiple trauma, as I said. Which brings me to the SKY, which is Supporting Kids and Youth. That's what it's the, that acronym is for. Is that we do a community consultation and it's our family counselor who does that. So she does training for teachers. As I said earlier, the teachers weren't aware of the difference between what this guy, this kid was going through was not uh, just bad behavior because he could. There was the trauma behind that. And we, we do a lot of work with Child First, all of those type of agencies to um, highlight what is different, what is needed to, to work with these vulnerable children. And so just coming back to desistance, uh, research shows that, you know, we, unless, uh, not unless, with good family relationships, it is um, the key for someone desisting crime. So if I just go back to the, the parent who's now just six weeks ago started talking to his child, the hope that we have is that this is going to influence his way of thinking. He may become a better parent. He may find the connection with his child will lead him to desist crime. And as it says there, family relationships and family reunification is a key role in changing and desisting crime. Um, and so if we put those circles together again, that's what we do. We're in the middle and we, we do all of the things in the green. And with this young man, we certainly hope it's gonna end up in a good space. Um, I'm not gonna go through desistance. I think you get what desistance is. <laughs> so just to give you another perspective on what we do, we also have a mentoring program where we have uh, social inclusion and it's uh, an alternative approach, approach to rethinking recidivism. And I presented this as a, uh, a presentation to the Adult Parole Board Conference um, a year ago in that, you know, we have to build meaningful relationships for the men coming out of custody or the men in the criminal justice system for there to be a success. So whilst their fo focus is justice or correctional supervision uh, and compliance, our focus is different. It's communication, it's links, and it's a supportive context. Um, and that are, those are our programs, which I won't go through, but you can see what we do. And the last one, of course, is our fabulous relationship with the Red Cross. Thanks, Vi. Um, I guess the key program, as I alluded to uh, earlier in the presentation, is our Prison Visitor Resource Centre. Um, this program was um, a co-design with Red Cross, VACRO, and indeed involved one of the um, correction facility um, directors um, in the design of the actual program. Uh, the program commenced in 2006-2007, uh, um, and the aim of the program is to support families of offenders um, and really maintaining or establishing that relationship uh, whilst the person is incarcerated. Um, the current program runs in three prisons in Victoria, uh, Port Phillip Prison, uh, Fulham Prison in Sale, and we recently commenced the program in the Melbourne Assessment Prison. 
The aim of the program is to improve the um, prison visit experience for families um, and also other members of the community, uh, to facilitate the continuation of those visits and, and to support the actual visitors themselves. Um, often people have to travel quite a lot of distance to get to um, some of our correctional facilities, um, sometimes using various modes of public transport, sometimes, you know, in inclement weather conditions, um, sometimes with very young kids, uh, or indeed people with disabilities. Um, so there's a number of challenges or barriers to maintaining that connection with the prisoner, and we believe that by facilitating uh, through our um, volunteers uh, a visit center, we can uh, hope to address and engage those visitors in a very positive and um, sustainable way. Um, it also um, assists in maintaining those family ties um, uh, during the period of incarceration, and, and there's certainly um, a strong evidence base that the impact of uh, maintaining those um, links, those familial or community links, uh, makes for better outcomes on release uh, back into those uh, family units or those communities. Um, the resource centers themselves are actually um, facilitated by um, Red Cross trained volunteers. Um, and um, in 2013, we had approximately 8,000 visitors through those um, centers. Um, and in terms of the impact on families and children, there was about 2,000 of those visitors who were children. The role of our um, Red Cross volunteers in those visit centres um, ranges from sharing information, um, support, uh, offering information on other services and referrals, um, be it drug and alcohol, counselling, um, other organisations uh, around family and personal support. Sometimes it's basics around sitting down, having a cup of tea, hearing their story, um, showing understanding and empathy. Um, sometimes people don't get to visit because they don't have enough identification or they've got some prior uh, criminal history themselves, which um, means that they've traveled quite a long distance and, and then don't get to visit. So another role is to really inform those individuals around what, in, what information and identification they actually need for that visit to happen the next time and to encourage them indeed to come back. Sometimes there, um, there's you know, some challenges to the actual visit for the visitors themselves. There may be fractured relationships that they're um, engaging with. Um, so there's also a role for personal support when, when visitors come out of the actual prison itself. Um, and that's another role that our volunteers take on, providing emotional support. Um, uh, we also interact with the prison staff and part of our training uh, of our volunteers is to engage with the prison staff. And certainly when we've reviewed and evaluated the program in a number of our prisons, uh, we've had uh, some very positive responses from the reception uh, security staff in those prisons around um, the change in culture and the change uh, in temperature around some of those um, visit times, which can be quite chaotic and quite stressful for uh, visitors and staff. Now, I've, we've got a YouTube uh, video here, which I'm hoping is going to work. Two minutes, yes. I'm going to end up in prison too, just because my dad's there. You're wrong if you think there are other possibilities for me. I know a criminal breeds a criminal. It's not true there's good in everyone. My dad's a bad person. Don't think that it could be different for me. That's where I'm going. Doing well at school, finding a good job, that's not important to me. Being in a gang, getting into fights is what matters. Listening to me, you should just write me off and don't ever believe I want to succeed. I've dropped out, I'm out of reach. Don't assume that I can become anything. You see, the script of my life has already been written. Don't dare to say there's still hope for me. If things were done differently, there could be potential. It's over. Unless you reverse your thinking, totally turn around how you see me, and don't believe it's over. There could be potential if things were done differently. There's still hope for me. Don't dare to say the script of my life has already been written. You see, I can become anything. Don't assume that I've dropped out. I'm out of reach. I want to succeed.
I don't ever believe you should just write me off. Listening to me is what matters. Getting into fights, being in a gang, that's not important to me. Finding a good job, doing well at school, that's where I'm going. It could be different for me. Don't think that my dad's a bad person. There's good in everyone. It's not true a criminal breeds a criminal. I know there are other possibilities for me. You're wrong if you think just because my dad's there, I'm going to end up in prison too. One more slide, which is about working collaboratively and working together, and uh, um, you know, looking after the well-being and development of children is all our business. Thank you. You've got to have that. Thank you. What a very clever and innovative note to end on. If we could just run backwards through it. Um, thank you very, very much. We have to release these people, however. Uh, because it's the last session and we've got to move on to a little break and then the final, final session. Um, so I hope you've feasted on our buffet of social inclusion delights, as I promised you at the outset. Um, we had four sessions and we're just about on time, which is not bad at all, discipline from everybody. One on each part of our four social inclusion parts of our um, strategy. Uh, internal and external speakers, I thank them all. There have been eight presenters. Vi, Lotta, thank you very much. From Vacro, Paul Morgan from Sane, thank you, Paul. Um, Amy Henderson and Elvis Fields. Um, all of our Red Cross uh, speakers, Deb and Vicky and James and Eamon. But I also want to thank the person who pulled it all together, the person who designed it, the person who pulled this together. It's been quite a tour de force, as they say, a real big effort. Ian Coverdale, thank you, Ian, is the uh, national manager, <laughs> social inclusion. Thanks. And supported by Kerry, uh, Kerry McGrath. Um, the, um, the one thing that all of these four sessions that we've had um, uh, have in common, I think, is that they all seek to restore that thing which we identified at the beginning as uh, restoring dignity to people through respect. And uh, we just want to try and recognise as our Secretary General, our new Secretary General, Mr. Az, Sai, said, we just want to try and recognise the common humanity that we all share and to respect that. And if we can find ways through our little programs, we can't do everything, but we don't want to abandon any of this. We want to do something. We have to be strategic. We have to apply whatever resources we've got to these areas. We want to build on them, try and be more innovative, try and get better outcomes but keep working in that way to try and help restore respect and dignity. Thank you all for your time. Thank you all to the presenters. Thanks to all the presenters.